the first thing that I wanted to cover uh, that I think is fairly new and at least up to this point, maybe there have been some posts about it. Uh, I've seen some tweets and LinkedIn posts and things like that, but I haven't come across any blog posts or anything. Let me show you. Uh, there are some new local administrator settings in Entra. So if I go to the Entra Admin Center and go to Devices and All Devices and Device Settings, this is where typically we are configuring who in our organization are allowed to join devices to Entra, who can register devices, things like that. But down here, this looks a little bit different to me, Johan, because all we had here previously was this link, manage additional local administrators on all Microsoft and Entra joined devices. And this link allowed us to add a user or a group that would be an admin on every single device that is joined to your tenant by default. But these two settings right here are very interesting. The other uh, role that is added by default, at least up to this point in time, is a global administrator role. So when a user joins their device to an, an Entra ID tenant, the global administrator role um, is one of the roles that's added as a local admin on your device. We now have the option to shut that off, which is interesting, I think. We yeah. also have this new setting here. Registering user is added as local administrator on the device during an Entra join. So by default, the third thing that gets added when somebody joins uh, to the local administrators group, when somebody joins the device to Entra, is the person joining the device. We can now set that to none or a selected uh, group of users um, will still be added as a local admin after they've joined the device. So some of the questions I've seen pop up is, how does this interact with our settings in autopilot? Uh, in autopilot, we've been able to configure uh, whether or not the user going through the enrollment process is a local admin at the end of that process or not, or just a standard user. We have not had this control for just simply joining a device to Entra. Um, I wonder if this is when you just use the uh, access work or school wizard. That would, I think that would be, that's a great question. Uh, that would be my assumption. Um, I'm sure that this question has been answered already, but I have not seen an answer to it. I personally have not seen the answer to it yet. Um, but at any rate, uh, another option to control these default settings, uh, I think you and I would probably argue is a good thing. Shiny, yeah. Love it. So uh, that is not the only thing new this week, though. Uh, Microsoft Intune 2403 was released. I'm still in my brain mixing up. I keep wanting to say 2304. Um, but 2403 was released, and we've had a few things uh, come out with Intune that I just wanted to point out uh, to everybody. As usual, this What's New page is a little bit longer than some of the highlights, but uh, I did want to highlight uh, Copilot and Intune is now available as a public preview. Interested to uh, check that out and see what that's going to be able to do for us. I believe Security Copilot was also finally released as a public preview. Is that correct? Did you hear that? Yes, and there were some discussions I saw. People are asking, okay, what will be the cost for it? Because there were these secure compute units or SCU, whatever they call it. They, they were quite pricey. And, and the estimates of the website shows up in even just having one of those units running for a month was a good few thousand dollars. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, shows up in the estimate for the service. So I, I have no idea if that will be the cost or, or how this play out, but there were a lot of folks in the community uh, speculating, okay, the, wow, 
should I turn this on? What will happen? Yeah, interesting. Well, curious to hear more about that for sure. Yeah. So if anyone happened to know uh, that the real cost for uh, playing around with this, even in a smaller tenant, uh, by all means, uh, let us know. Yes, please. A um, couple of other things I wanted to highlight uh, as I get down here, some new uh, Windows settings, catalog settings. I did notice, and I wanted to point these out to you, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Several delivery optimization settings have been added. Uh, that is, of course, shiny. Of course it is. Anything that we can do to control and work with DO. Um, we also had... Is it? There it is. The security baseline for uh, Windows 11 23H2 uh, was released um, <clears throat> with this service release. So we've been waiting on this uh, baseline update for a, quite a while now. Um, happy to see this get added uh, as well. This also, um, the new security baseline, um, is based on settings catalog settings. Uh, which is fantastic as well. We've talked about uh, many times here on Office Hours over the last couple of years. Uh, settings catalog is really the uh, has been the way forward for for configuring settings in Intune. So happy to see that improvement as well. Um, and then I thought I'd just give a brief uh, uh, show a, a brief bit about this section: improvements for Intune deployments of Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. Um, so there are a few changes in the endpoint security uh, setting, or pane, rather, in the Intune Admin Center um, that add some new uh, reporting uh, visibility um, <clears throat> into our dashboard. Uh, so if I pop over there real quick and go to endpoint security, you'll see we have a couple of new... Um, uh, visible uh, reports here right on the dashboard showing the number of Windows devices onboarded to Defender for Endpoint, which if you are using Defender for Endpoint in your environment is fantastic. If you are using an alternative, maybe that's information you don't want to see, but nevertheless, it's there, as well as the antivirus agent status. Um, and I think over here, on yes, the Endpoint Detection Response page, uh, some improvements here. Uh, that also show that similar data. So you have that reporting on whether or not your devices have been onboarded into Defender, um, which if you're in this pane, you likely are using Defender. Uh, so I just like this uh, top level at a glance type of visibility um, that we have available to us here. Uh, so I wanted to just call that out as uh, those are a few highlights on the uh, quite large 2403 Intune service release. Now, uh, last but not least, uh, I wanted to bring up a blog post from Michael Niehaus. Um, as a side note, I talked a little bit last week about the Azure AD PowerShell module and the um, MS Online PowerShell module being deprecated. That happened uh, Monday, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so if you're still using those PowerShell modules, please uh, update to the Microsoft Graph SDK. Uh, but in a similar vein, many of our old uh, Intune scripts used a well-known uh, PowerShell, or a well-known uh, Entra registered application ID uh, that's been around for, I don't know, would you say years, Johan, um, that essentially all of our tenants had this application ID. So if you had a, an application secret or a user that had permissions into Intune and along with this well-known uh, ID, you would be able to pretty easily connect to a uh, tenant um, and potentially elevate your credentials. With this application ID, uh, as of April 1st, so Monday, uh, that application was essentially going away uh, and you would have to create your own custom app ID. So you create your own app registration, generate your own secret, 
uh, and the thought is that at least at that point, you're not using a well-known uh, application ID. And hopefully, as Michael puts here in his blog post, in your app registration, you are restricting who in your tenant can actually use that app uh, and putting some additional security controls around how long that secret is made available and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so this had the potential, has the potential to affect a, a lot of folks. If you're having some trouble with your Intune scripts this week, it's a possibility that this has something to do with it. Um, but this was not all Michael wrote about over the weekend. Uh, I don't no, know he's, if you... he's been he's been busy. <laughs> I'll just click back to his. Uh, Quick back to his his home page here. Uh, you aren't kidding. He has been busy. All of these top posts have been put out since March 29th. Um, so kudos to Michael. Um, I don't know if one particularly interesting one that I that I saw uh, was this one. I don't know if you happen to come across this one, Johan. But when does a Windows client sync with Intune? Um, because this can be confusing. Uh, yeah, especially with the new sync engine coming in as well for uh, some of the new features for uh, endpoint privilege management. Yeah, uh, which has a very different sync, sync schedule than the, the the other stuff. Definitely, um, it's one of those. It feels like uh, what what you always say is like the consulting answer, right? When does it? When, <laughs> yeah, exactly. When does Windows client sync with Intune? It depends. It depends. Oh, we can we can be pretty sure that it's going to happen about every eight hours, but also sometimes more than that. <laughs> yeah, That's beautiful. So another great post here. Um, on that note, though, uh, do you have anything that uh, that you'd like to share that you've come across over the last week? Yeah, a, a few things. First, uh, I learned about the existing of a PowerShell module that I have didn't stumble across before, and uh, obviously it was Niehaus uh, that that kind of led me into that direction and looking into it. I'm going to show that in a little bit. Uh, okay. I had the, the fortune of being uh, uh, working with Niehaus today uh, for for a customer uh, doing some troubleshooting uh, for delivery optimization, which is always fun. And I still have to pinch my arm, being like, "All right, we're actually on the same team now, working with the same customers." It's odd, but fun. Yeah, incredible. But in terms of news, I did stumble across a, I like to say, a scathing or very harsh report uh, against the security incident last summer. So it was. Uh, let me see if I can get a window open and actually share it at the same time. That is kind of pushing the limits, I think. <laughs> you can oh, do it. it. <laughs> uh, I decided to take a two-step approach in that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here we are. There uh, we go. So it was the uh, infamous storm something something number. Uh, incident last summer, and uh, the Cyber Defense Agency just published a fairly lengthy report uh, on this that you can download and, and or just view online for that matter. But uh, they did not <laughs> tread lightly on on how they worded things. There was like that yeah, this should never have happened, and yes, they could have done better. And they, in this case, uh, they're referring to Microsoft's uh, own security uh, organization. So, but it's a good read, uh, very well written, a lot of facts, a lot of like, okay, this is what happened. And so this, of course, has been a major incident uh, last year. And this week, or these last few weeks, the, the uh, XC library is pretty scary. That was a close call. Could have been so much worse. Yeah, I, I mean, I, from what I've read, it was basically a, a years-long social engineering attack uh, against an open-source GitHub repository. Um, I, really wild to see the details as people are starting to analyze them and figure out how this happened. 
yeah and I, all the planning that went into it like sneaking in change after change after change that combined with a bunch of sample files actually led to uh, vulnerability that's uh, that is pretty crazy yeah all right um I was really, really hoping for that we would also see the light of a new config manager release today, uh, 24 or 3, but that didn't happen. That makes me, I was sad. But all right, Intune we have to, to use for now and then see what happens with the config manager release. I just ordered myself another um, laptop on eBay, uh, ThinkPad XS13S, XC- uh, X13S. Uh, which has that little characteristic that it's an ARM device. So, and 24.3 is supposed to have ARM imaging support because the technical preview have it. Or the 23.11 technical preview has it. Oh, that's shiny. It is shiny. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. I'll, I'll keep you posted. Uh, All right. That part. Uh, my trouble right now is to try to find a, a Ethernet dongle that is capable of <laughs> pixie booting such a device. Uh, and has drivers in WinP for it, so we'll see. Uh-huh. Interesting. Yeah, you have yeah. to keep us posted on that one, too. Yep, 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 yep. Anyhow, uh, here I have a, uh, a partial prompt uh, and an empty temp folder. And if I save that PowerShell module, Delivery Optimization Troubleshooter, uh, it's written one of the engineers at the Microsoft team. Uh, but if I save that script, obviously it shows up in the folder. I can go ahead and run it. And it has uh, three different switches, the current version. Uh, there are rumors about the upcoming versions, but for now, this is it what they have. But I can run it for a regular health check. I can run it for uh, hearing. And I can run it to get some information about the connected cast server. But even if I do just the health check one, it does run some quick, um, well, health checks about my device, making sure that the service is actually running, which is uh, helpful, Uh, checking how much memory I have, how much disk space I have. And then it does some configurations on a few different ports. Uh, And it also checks that my device uh, actually can reach uh, the CDN service that Microsoft has uh, for this. Uh, what I learned earlier today, though, that this particular check here kind of lies a little bit because the script is actually doing a ping or the <laughs> equivalent of a ping uh, to these servers. And you can still have access to those, but not being able to do ping because some organizations is actually blocking it. So sure enough, we found an environment where they could be reached, but they could not be pinged. So this test set fail instead of success. So, uh, but that is not too hard to to test yourself. You simply borrow one of these. You do a testnet connection. And I also learned that the good old test connection that the script uses uh, to do the ping in PowerShell 7, you can specify a port. Ooh. In PowerShell 5 or Windows PowerShell, you cannot. So that's why I'm using testnet connection instead. But anyhow, uh, that allows me to do a test connection and, and uh, happiness. Uh, anyhow, so that, um, that was I spent my part of my morning with. And then I spent the rest of my afternoon together with Mike Terrell arguing about two Pixie servers or with two Pixie servers. Uh, just to learn after a bit of troubleshooting, yep, both of them had their certificate certificate expired today. Like, what are the odds? The one day we sit down to do work with them, <laughs> a two year cert decided to nah. <laughs> you you deserve a hug after having to deal with certs <laughs> this afternoon.